are now live. Just a second. Okay, we're live. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Those listening, those watching, those here helping with the service today. We thank God in Yeshua's name for all of you here or wherever you are, wherever you're watching from, wherever you're listening from. So today, we get into the sermon today. Sermon, a slight modification from the uh, title on my screen in back of me. It says, remember the to-do list. And I'm ch changing that to remember God's to-do list. Now, the Parsha of Vayikhanon constitutes Deuteronomy 3, verse 23, through 7, verse 11. It tells how Moses asked to see the land of Israel and made arguments to obey the law. We should obey the law. It recounted setting up the cities of refuge. Uh, reciting the Ten Commandments, the Shema, and gave instructions for Israel's conquest of the Promised Land. Parsha of Echanan is like a to-do list, like God's to-do list. It reads this way. It's about remembering what is important and what you have to do to walk with God, to walk in line with God. The word remember, zachor, in Hebrew, zachor, and in Greek, it's mimnesko. It's mentioned more than 200 times, depending on your translation, it could be in the 230s, the 220s, it's more than 200 times in the Bible. And in the book of Devarim, or Deuteronomy, it's more than 14 times. And for example, in the Ten Commandments here in our Parsha, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says, observe the Sabbath. This means to keep it and do it. But back in Exodus chapter 20, the commandment says to remember the Sabbath. So first God teaches us, and then he says, remember and after that, he says, do it. Do it. The story is told of a, uh, of a burglar, a thief. And he comes to a house, and in the front yard, a big sign says, remember, God is watching you. And he breaks into the house, and a small voice says, remember, God is watching you. And the burglar kind of laughs to himself, and he looks around, and he looks around, and he sees a parrot in a cage, and the thief asks, goes to the parrot, and he asks him, And what's your name? Moses, says the bird. And the burglar gives uh, like a smile at that and asks, What kind of idiot calls his parrot Moses? To which the parrot replies, The same kind of idiot who calls their Rottweiler Pharaoh. Growl. Anyway, remember the sign said, remember God is watching you? He ignored that, broke into the house. The parrot said, remember God is watching you? He ignored that. And then he got to meet Pharaoh, the Rottweiler. Let me tell you, it was a rough experience. Okay. Anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. It says, and you shall remember, Zakor, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God took you out from there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. And therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. What is this commandment to me? Well, it's obviously... God speaking to Israel, and we can leave it at that, and much of the world believes it exactly like that. It's for Israel. Well, 
At the time that God is saying this, both in Deuteronomy 5 and back in Exodus chapter 20, 19 and 20, it wasn't only Israel who was there on the mountain with God. There was a mixed multitude there. You see, when Egypt fell apart, all the slaves from all the nations, not just Israel, not just the Hebrews, but people from everywhere. I mean, Egypt had slaves from all over. They were the, at the time, they were the one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful at the highlight of, uh, at the high point of their society. They were the most powerful country in the world. A mixed multitude. By the way, Jewish research has shown that a tribe had to be appointed. You won't find this in the scriptures, but it's in uh, Jewish history, that a tribe had to be appointed to watch over these Gentiles, to take care of them. Remember, Israel at the time was a, became a mighty army. That someone had to watch them. Which tribe? And very interestingly, it was Judah. They encamped with Judah. And believe you me, there was nobody there in that encampment asking anyone, either fellow Gentiles or, or their brother or sister uh, Israeli or, or Hebrew people, uh, could you please pass the shrimp? They were eating what everybody else was eating. What do you think they did? Oh, uh, they said, okay, well, God says the Sabbath day, so that's for you guys. We're going to be over here having a picnic. You know, you guys have fun. We'll be at the beach. There's plenty of sand here. We can't find the water, but we found the sand. So it's for Israel and all people from the nations that have attached themselves to Israel. You know, I once read a true story. I once read a true story of a woman who had um, been just learning to golf. Has anyone ever played golf? Anybody ever played golf? Even a little bit? You've watched golf. You've seen it. I had this one guy tell me he was a golf pro. I said, really? Where do you play? And he told me he was on a miniature golf course. But anyhow. So this woman, she had been at it for about a month, okay, taking some lessons she'd been at it when her father-in-law invited her to go golfing with him. And after teeing off uh, one, of the, uh, one of the holes, her father-in-law was intent on finding the ball she had, uh, that he had sliced into the rough, you know, into the trees, into the shrubs there. And the woman, concentrating deeply on her stroke, on her drive, uh, was unaware of his location. Her shot was low, and whistling ball passed within inches of its head. He instinctively dropped to the ground. Almost immediately, the woman yelled out. Uh, she said, I would have warned you, but I couldn't remember the number to yell. <laughs> now, what number was she supposed to yell? Four. Four. But actually, it's F-O-R-E, not the number four. Nowadays, most golfers yell four only after they've hit an errant shot toward an unsuspecting golfer. In other words, they don't, when they're about to tee off, they don't yell four anymore. They just hit the ball. But, and if it goes in the wrong way and they see it's going to hit to some people or something, then they yell four. And uh, the term, which translates to watch out, uh, or heads up, was originally intended to be used before teeing off. The prefix for, F-O-R-E, originated during the Middle Ages, and in general indicates that something is ahead or in front of. But nonetheless, she did not yell it. Why not? Why didn't she yell for? Well, she forgot. She did not remember. She was a new golfer. It's a new golfer. In the panic of the moment, and in her very limited experience, she froze. And frankly, she endangered her father-in-law, and she knew it, 
because she forgot. Forgetting things can be dangerous. God says, remember the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath. If you forget to put oil in your car, you can ruin the engine. If you forget to turn off the burner on the stove, you can burn down the house. And if you forget your anniversary, oh boy, you've got trouble. And in our Parsha today in Vayikhanan, in Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 6, God is telling us that if we want to have the kind of a family or life, home life, that will make us proud, if we want a G-rated, which by the way, I'm not using the movie system, I'm talking about God-rated. If we want to have a G-rated home, a God-rated home, then you and I need to start to remember God is watching. We need to remember certain things, and we need to teach it to our friends and families to remember those things. Well, they don't want to listen. Moses never stopped trying. Abraham never stopped trying. How many years did Noah try to teach the people the will of God, and they laughed in his face until finally uh, the flood came, his ark sailed, they all died, and he and his family and all those animals lived tried. How long did Yeshua teach and preach and try to bring the truth? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long, how long I have wanted to take you. You would not, you were not willing, he says. We need to remember. You know, back in the old days, this goes back before my time, but I've seen it in old black and white movies. Sometimes a person would tie a ribbon or string on their finger, or their wife would, or the mom would, and, and that would be to remember not to forget to do something important that day. Nowadays, we have to-do lists, and calendars in our phones, and alarms in our telephones, and, and, uh, and they tell us to remember important things. What time to wake up? Oh, I have a doctor's appointment in three hours or, or tomorrow, or whatever it is. We have these calendars and or some of us make lists. Some of us have a list on the fridge or we have a calendar in the kitchen or something and we write there, okay, next Tuesday I have an appointment with Dr. Uh, Leibowitz. Now, the question I was asking myself, thinking about these words about remember. And how many times God says remember in the Bible. Think about what do we need to teach our friends and families to remember? What is it we're supposed to teach? Hey, look at the Bible. It's a massive text. What are we supposed to teach them? Well, Sometimes we don't remember a lot of the sermon. I mean, within 30 minutes to an hour, we've forgotten probably 75%. That's how the human mind works. But we remember stories. So here's one. A Shabbat school teacher asked her group of children if any of them could quote the entire 23rd Psalm. And a four-year-old little girl raised up her hand. A bit skeptical, the teacher asked if she could really quote the entire song. And the little girl smiled and she said, yes, I can do it. So she said, go ahead. And all the, all the class turned to listen to her. And you know, you know, all the, the Shabbat teachers, Shabbat students, they turned, they're all looking at her. She stands up and says, the Lord is my, is my shepherd and that's all I want. You know, we live in an R-rated world that wants to take God out of the government, out of the schools, out of any part of the public arena. And so it has become increasingly important that we realize that our friends, our family, especially our children, so I all have children. You have a niece, you have a nephew, you have a roommate. He or she has a kid. 
there's got to be kids around your life somewhere. And kids are very important to God. Suffer the little children, Yeshua says. For the kingdom of heaven is made of such as these. Our children need to hear that God can be their shepherd and that he can be all they will ever want or need in their lives. And God told Israel to teach their families exactly that. Teach these diligently to your children. That's what he said. Think about my words. When you wake up, when you go to sleep, when you're walking along the way, think about it. I recite the Shema twice a day. And it teaches me that I'm supposed to think about him and his word all the time. Not once a week. I don't get my two hour a week uh, uh, holy injection. Zip, okay, good, thanks, I had enough of God today. Let me go back to my real life. He is the real life. You see, there's this Jewish dilemma about Superman and Batman. You may have heard about this before. You see, they are, in a way, polar opposites in how they these superhero characters exist in their stories. You see, Batman, he ha he's actually Bruce Wayne. That's who he really is. And he puts on his costume to become Batman. But you see, Superman is the absolute opposite. You see, Superman is always Superman. He's always Kal El, which by the way is a Hebrew for is Hebrew for all God, by the way. Kal or Kol is all. Everything, everyone. How cold and L is God. So his name means all God. Isn't that interesting? And he comes to earth, descending from the sky, to save humanity. Interesting messianic image, isn't it? Here's the difference between Batman and Superman. And it's the difference between all those people out there and what we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be Batman. We're supposed to be Superman. You put on your hat and your coat, your jacket, your clothing, and you look like everybody else when you walk outside. But underneath, you're actually Kyle L. You, you're not Clark Kent. When Superman puts on his glasses and his hat, and the thing, and the coat, and the tie, and he goes, and he acts all stupid -y and he gets into the, oh, sorry, I spilled the coffee, Lois. <laughs> That's his mask. That's who he really is not. See, Batman puts on his mask, his costume, to become the person that we want to see. Who cares about Bruce Wayne? We want to see Batman. Who cares about Clark Kent? We want to see Superman. But Superman is who he really is. Not who he's pretending to be. Clark Kent is who he's pretending to be. But Batman is really Bruce Wayne. That's really who he is. All the phonies out there and the fakes out there, and those who try to let you believe that they are, righteous or religious or God-fearing or some of these things are really just Bruce Wayne. Because what they're showing you on that Saturday, on that Sunday, at that uh, retreat or whatever, is the Batman costume. Because underneath, they're weak and they're worthless. Because they're walking a path with the world. And they are so entrenched in it, their feet are in cement, and they can't come out of it. That's how deep they are entrenched in the values, in the morals of the world. Not in God's word, but in the world's word. 
and we see them and we talk to them and they're part of everyday life, whether they live close by us in our buildings, uh, we see them, uh, we, buy, we go get our coffee and there they are, or whatever is the case. Some of them are even family members and friends. My son was criticized last year in his school because he brought up God. I don't remember why he brought it up, but he was strictly criticized in the class that he is not to talk about God. He didn't talk about God. This little girl stands up and says, at four years old, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. No, it's not scripture, is it? But it's truth. God is our shepherd and he should be all that we want. And we need to remember this. That's what God is saying in the verses of Deuteronomy 6. He's saying, it says that Adonai is, is God, and he is one. He wasn't going to share his glory with anyone else. And that God had brought them out of slavery. God had given them blessings they did not deserve. Wells they hadn't dug, houses they hadn't built, fields they hadn't planted. They were to love Adonai, their God, with all their heart, soul, and strength. And they were to obey all his commands, decrees, and laws. And they were never to take him lightly. God was a merciful God, and he loved his people, all his children. But they were always to remember, there's that word again, that he was not a passive God. They were not to mess with him. Right in this Parsha, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, verse 4. Is a consuming fire. That's not a fire that looks like fire but doesn't burn. A consuming fire is what God really is. Anything touches, it's gone. I'm not sure I believe that, Rabbi. Okay, why don't you go ask the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu? Why don't you ask them, ask their father Aaron, if God is a consuming fire? God is a consuming fire. He's not a passive God. They're not to mess with him. In other words, God was asking them to put him first in every area of their life. Not just on Sabbath or on, or on the holy festivals. You know, I, I don't know what the expression is in, in Christianity. But in Judaism, uh, the Jews that come out to the synagogue only on the holy days, like Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, they're called, they call, we call them holiday Jews. They come out on the holidays. And uh, I'm sure most of everybody uh, uh, watching, listening or, uh, uh, to my message today has heard this old joke about the holiday Jews that, you know, one, uh, one day um, after Yom Kippur, uh, the rabbi is saying goodbye to people at the synagogue, and, and the people are, are, are leaving, and he sees this guy, uh, he, and, and uh, he sees him every year, and he says, uh, uh, so Max, he says, uh, 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 you know, uh, don't you think it's time that you, you know, that you join the army of God? And uh, Max says, Rabbi, I'm already in God's army. And the rabbi says, well, then how come I only see you you know, uh, a couple of times a year. And he says, because I'm in the secret service. <laughs> but God wants us to put him first in every area of our lives. He was asking Israel to put him first in their public lives and their private lives, in their schools and their workplace, in their past and their present, and yes, their future. This commitment to him, they were told, would give their families advantages that no other nation had ever experienced of having their God deliver them 
from slavery, of having their God show them these signs and wonders, of having a God who would go with them. No other nation. And that promise is true for us today as well. But by contrast, if we don't make this our priority, if we don't put God first in our life, it's possible to set your family up for failure. People take a passive approach to their children's uh, upbringing when it comes to faith. Oh, let them do, you know, their teens, their this, their that. Let them do, let them. So they let them and let them and wonder why that when they're in their 20s and 30s, they have nothing to do with God whatsoever. They go the complete opposite way. What do you mean you decided to become a Buddhist? Years ago, there was a popular flyer that was put out in some messianic communities. It was also used in churches in a different style. And it was called, The Top 10 Ways to Turn Your Kids Off uh, uh, from Synagogue. Top 10 Ways to Turn Them Off. And I'm grateful and hopeful that we don't experience this type of thinking in our congregation, but it's always wise to examine ourselves anyway to make sure that this is not true of us. Here are the 10 reasons used in the flyer, and I call them the adversary's 10 commandments. 10, schedule personal or family events to conflict with school services and activities. Prayer calls and everything else. Uh, nine, don't get too close to anyone in shul. Refrain from developing relationships with other members in messianics, lest your children learn the joy and benefits of godly fellowship with other believers. Number eight, look often at your watch during shul and complain. Look annoyed and freak out when the service lasts longer than you think it should. Number seven, tithe and financially support your shul and its missions in the same with the same enthusiasm as you pay your taxes. Number six, do the best you can to make sure the kids arrived on time to soccer lessons and school events, but don't worry if they miss or are late for shul. Bring, uh, number five, bring your family to shul only when A, you have nothing better to do, B, you have a personal need, or C, you're feeling really guilty. Number four, don't volunteer for anything or make any kind of long-term commitment at your shul. Remember, you've got to keep your options open to do the things that are more fun or more important to you. Number three, change shuls every few years. Number two, remind your kids how imperfect your shul leaders are and their members and regularly point out their mistakes. Number one, and whatever you do, don't let the shul influence the way you live your life. How opposite that is to, say, Orthodox Judaism. The shul influences every part of their life. If you ever meet an Orthodox Jewish real estate person, the first thing they're asked by their clients, Orthodox people moving to that area, you're going to show them an apartment. Right off the top, they're letting them know, yes, there's a place for a sukkah, for you to build your sukkah during Sukkot, the festival of booths, tabernacles, right? right? There's a place for sukkah. Yes, it's a kosher kitchen. It has two refrigerators, has this and that. Yeah, they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, They're not wanting to hear how close it is to transportation. And those other things are important, but not the most important. And they keep waving it off. Okay, get to the bottom line here. What's the bottom line? We're thinking the bottom line is the price, right? For them, the bottom line is... How close or far is it from the synagogue? It's two blocks away. Deal. Well, it would take you about 30 minutes to walk it. Eh, I don't think so. Story is told of a young Jewish boy who grew up in Germany many years ago. The boy had a profound admiration for his father. This is a true story, and it's tragic. So pay attention. The boy had a profound admiration for his father, who saw to it that the life of the family revolved around the religious practices of their faith. The father led them to the synagogue faithfully. In his teen years, however, the boy's family was forced to move to another town in Germany. The town had no synagogue, 
but only a Lutheran church. The life of the community revolved around the church. All the best people belonged to it. Suddenly, the father announced to the family that they were going to abandon their Jewish traditions, values, and, and uh, faith and join the Lutheran church. When the son family asked why, their father explained that it would be good for his business. The youngster was bewildered and confused. His deep disappointment soon gave way to anger and a kind of intense bitterness that plagued him throughout his whole life. Later, he left Germany, he went to England to study. While he was there, he began to write a book. In that book, he introduced a whole new worldview and conceived a movement that was designed to change the world. He described religion as the opiate of the masses. He committed the people who followed him to live their lives without God. His name was Karl Marx, the founder of the communist movement. The history of the 20th century was significantly perverted by Marx's teaching, all because his father sold out his true Jewish faith, did not remain faithful in the teachings of God. The lesson here is that when we sell out our faith to the highest bidder, we set our families up for discouragement and failure, our friends, our families, our children. You see, God promised, he promises now that if we put him first in our, in our family and in our life, he will give us certain blessings. Why? Because he says so. And that doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen from time to time. Yeshua himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. And we're going to face sickness and loss and hardship and death because we live in a fallen world. This is not the kingdom of heaven. But if we follow God and we keep our faith in Yeshua, then that's exactly where we're headed. The book of Revelation has a teaching. I know this is not popular in certain circles, but it's in the scripture. This, it says, this is the revelation of the saints, they that keep the commandments of God and their faith in Yeshua the Messiah. Sorry, this is the perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints, the holy ones. They that keep their faith in Yeshua, and, and, uh, they that keep God's commandments and their faith in Yeshua the Messiah. You need both. Not one, not the other, both. But the promises that God gave in Deuteronomy chapter 6, what they mean to us today is that when bad things happen to us, God promises that he'll be right there. And he will give us the strength to face whatever this world throws at us. And if we strive to put God first in our family life, God promises these blessings. He says, I'm quoting from Deuteronomy 6, he says, it will go well with us. He says, we will prosper. He says, we will eat and be satisfied. We will receive righteousness. And God will deal with our enemies. And our enemies right now, amongst others in the world that you might think up, we have two really big enemies right now, right here. The virus and the violence. We put him first. What does he say? He will deal with our enemies. We will eat and we will be satisfied. We will prosper. It will go well with us. That's what he's promised. So all that we need to think about then is how do we put God first? We need to think about it. How do we put him first? How to structure our lives so that God comes first in our priorities. Deuteronomy 6, 4 uh, through 9 tells us in a kind of to-do list sort of way. To keep our faith putting God first at all times. It's known to Jews and Messianics as the Shema. 
and you know it well. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love Adonai, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today are to be upon your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You are to bind them as a sign upon your hand. And they are to be as frontlets between your eyes, and you are to write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. How many of you don't have a mezuzah on your door? Oh, I'm not Jewish. Who cares? Do you believe in, in the Bible? Do you believe in Yeshua? Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, well, that's a wonderful thing. But isn't it also true that the fathers of, of Christianity, the fathers of that faith, uh, didn't they per preserve uh, all five books of Moses, the Torah, and the prophets, and in what they call the Old Testament? Why didn't they simply throw it out and just have the New Testament? Why not? If that's all you feel applies to you, they kept it. And it says you were to put his name on your doorpost and on your gates. Do you have a mezuzah on your door? You have a little thing that inside is a scroll that has these words that I just read inside of that scroll up on your door with the power of the name of the living God in there at your door. Why does so much evil come in and out of my, my home? Well, I don't know. Is it the 13 different statues of pagan idols and gods you have in your house? Well, it's just a little jade Buddha. What harm could that do? We're going to find out. We think of the, what the Shema says here. In other words, it says, don't, you know, it's saying, don't make your faith a once a week thing. God says daily, when you walk in the way. Right? It says when you, when you wake up, when you go to sleep, all the time. Your kids need to see how much you love God every day. You love God, your kids need to know. Your grandkids need to know. Your parents need to know. Your brothers and sisters need to know. And they need to know why. Wherever you are, when you hear this sermon today, and whatever believing community you have been led to, remember that God must be first always. And that your shul is important and your rabbi and elders are all there to help you and to encourage you and to reinforce your efforts in your home. But we and they can't do your faith for you. Your rabbi, your priest, your pastor cannot do your faith for you. Their job is to guide you. Deuteronomy 6 is telling us that we can't expect our families to catch our faith by osmosis. We can't expect them to just stand around us and absorb our faith as we think godly thoughts. Mm, you get it yet? Doesn't work. Notice the way we're told to share our faith with our families. The scripture says, teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. I go to the barber shop last week, I have my hair cut for the first time in four months. I talked to the barber about God. Well, you're a rabbi, you have to believe. No, because you're not a rabbi, you should believe more. He's Jewish. Non-practicing. I said, so what does that make you? Almost Jewish. That's like being almost pregnant. Either you are or you're not. The scripture continues on saying that we are to tie this faith to our hands. We are to bind it to our forehead. We are to write it on our door frames. Hey, I'm about God's business here. Because it's right here. That's what I want to talk about. I have a family member. No matter how long I'm in faith, it's as long as he's out of it. And he says, I can't really talk to you because the only thing you want to talk about is God. Can't we talk about something else? 
let's talk about, I don't know, he likes football, he wants to talk about a football game. And the, this, you forgive me because I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know a whole lot about uh, the L.A. Rams won, and uh, I bet on them, and isn't that great? And I said, yeah, it must be great. God must have made them win. He hates that, right? He hates it. He hates it. But you see, when God says to tie it on your hands, to bind it on your forehead, to write it on your door frame, these are action words. These are action words. God is not calling us for a mumbled piety. He wants a shouting faith, a spoken faith, an action faith. Listen to Yaakov, to Jacob. He says, I'll show you my faith by my deeds. The shouting faith has to be your true faith. You have to be Kalel. You've got to be Superman. Not Bruce Wayne, who puts on the mask. We shouldn't even wear a mask. Orthodox Jews don't wear one. They're like that every day. The people of Israel looked so different from the Egyptians. No painted faces, no snakes coming off their foreheads. They were, you know, they didn't have those weird designs in the beard or the head or whatever. God tells them. You are not to, sh to, to shave the, the sides of your head. Uh, you're not to, you know, make uh, designs in your beard. We're not to do this. So they looked vastly different from the Egyptians who had been their captors. They were supposed to look different. God wants us to be different and to look different. But we are afraid because we're living in fear. And God did not give us a spirit of fear. Why are we afraid? Are we afraid to wear a messianic symbol? Are we afraid to be out there? Yes, I know there is anti-Semitism, there's violence, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a best friend, a family member, a co-worker sitting next to you that you know that, I don't know, she born Jewish but doesn't practice and doesn't believe and never goes to synagogue and the, you know, the last time she called them rabbis when she had to get married. Other than that, you know, let's see that. Birth, death, marriage, that's it. Other than that, forget about it. You don't need it. So, is that a Karl Marx kind of faith? Only when you need it? Well, gee, I'm going to have to pay $150 down at City Hall. Uh, my brother-in-law is a rabbi. He'll do it for free. I actually had a family member a few years ago. They had me do a wedding. And uh, it was free. God wants a shouting faith. Our faith has to be our true faith. It cannot be a put on. It dare not be something that you wear on your sleeve or wear outside like a mask. Because if your faith is not real, your family will know this. Your friends will know this. They'll feel it. Your children will feel it. And they will have a word to describe who you are. Hypocrite. You don't want that to happen. That will defeat the entire purpose of your faith. So how do I actively make myself real, uh, my faith real for my family? Sometimes it's just a matter of being faithful in doing the basics. Attending the shul regularly. Reading your Bible regularly. Praying daily. Putting God first all the time. man told about the time when he was just four years old and he watched his father pray at the Passover Seder. It's as far back as his memory went. Some kids can remember earlier, some not so early. I don't know where your earliest memories are. I have some memories from when I was three, but you know, before that, I, I don't really have anything. And the man, you know, he told about the time when he was four years old, he watched his father pray at the Passover Seder. It amazed him. It was an experience he never forgot. It was a Sunday evening that year. About 12 people gathered in a circle. 
at our table for the Pesach, the Passover. The main element, the matzah, covered simply with a white cloth, was on the table in the middle near the Seder plate, and the arrangement was intentional. You remember there was something, why is it there and why is it like that? It was intentional. It spoke of the first Seder over 3,000 years before, a very humble Seder in a small slave dwelling in Egypt at the table of Moses. And it spoke of the Seder some 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem in the upper room of an inn where Yeshua and his emissaries gathered for the Pesach, the last Passover of the Messiah, which was not completed. And while he was still with them, his time of sacrifice was close at hand. But it also spoke to all at the table that we were there because God had asked us to do this every year at that time to remember. And he says, and, and I drank from a small cup of grape juice and my father held a silver cup of wine and we drank and ate matzah in memory of Yeshua. Our Passover then. And my father said that Yeshua died for us on the Passover so we would not die because of our sins, but to have everlasting life through him, and through the blood he shed for us. And my father said to all at the table that we put God first, not only at Passover and on Shabbat, but every day of our lives, because he has always put us first. Those who love him and keep his commands and faith in his son, Yeshua of Nazareth. And even now the memory is clear, he writes. I thought to myself, thinking of what his father had said, he actually thinks he is talking to someone as he's praying. And whoever it is means more to him than anyone else in the world. And now the boy's father probably wasn't thinking about the impression he was making on his son. He was simply doing his faith publicly and actively with his son there with him. Doing the basics is critical to impressing your children with how much God means to you. But as significant as that can be, it's even more important to make sure that we share our faith with our kids, with our families, with our friends deliberately and intentionally. People, do people visit you at your apartment, your home, and when visiting is permissible, right now we have the virus, but when it's uh, permissible, is do you go to your home and you, um, uh, you know, you invite someone over and on the coffee table there's a statue of Buddha? I know somebody that had uh, a person that went to like Turkey or somewhere and came back with a statue of the goddess Diana. And they had it there. And it was a man of God, and it was in his office. And I looked at it, and I said, you have got to get rid of that. Oh, but so-and-so, a very, you know, beloved person, uh, brought that back for me. Well, give it back to them. Put it in a box. Sell it to a museum. I don't know. Do something. Get it out of your space. Do you really want to be under the hand of God? Deuteronomy 6 verse 7 says that we need to teach our words to our children. How do we teach them faith? Well, Romans 10, 17 tells us exactly how we teach faith to other people. It says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Messiah. That's a direct translation. Most of us have learned it in a way. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but it actually says Messiah. Teaching faith to our families, this can be as simple as telling your kids how much God has blessed you because of them. In doing this, you're telling your children that you love them, and you're telling how grateful uh, you are to God for Him blessing you. Or you could take your kid for breakfast, something like going out once a week uh, to eat breakfast, uh, and then read the Bible together, a passage, and talk about it. This can be a way of telling your child that this is uh, your special time together and you can focus this time on the most important thing to you, God's Word. 
Most importantly, the one thing you really must share with your children is God's stories. These are the stories showing how God has blessed you. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 20, it says, When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What are the testimonies and the statutes and the ordinances that Adonai, our God, commanded you? Right? Then you are to tell your son, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and Adonai brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, Adonai showed signs and wonders great and terrible on Egypt, on Pharaoh and all of his house. And then he brought us out from there so that he might bring us in to give us the land that he swore to our fathers. So God is saying here, tell your kids what I've done for you in the past. Tell your God stories. You know, my great uncles were alive, two of them, and they shared an apartment, and uh, both really old, and I was really young. And they told these stories over and over, and I never got tired of hearing them. And they weren't God stories, but they were stories about their youth, the days of playing simple games, of going up to the mountains to pick berries, about their first cars, and et cetera. And these stories shaped the way I looked at life and the world and myself. And what we need to realize is the vital significance of sharing our stories with our families, especially the stories of what God has done in our lives. My main point today, my main point is this. When we're dealing with our kids, our grandkids, our nephews, our nieces, it is critical that we share our faith with them. We must tell them about our faith. We must be so driven in this purpose that nothing will stop us from bringing Torah and Messiah to our children. When we tell our children, and what we tell them can shape their future. What kind of person are they going to grow up to be? What morals and values are they going to have? Are they going to roll with the world? Or are they going to roll with God? Hebrews 11 tells us what faith actually is. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of realities not seen. This is my closing story. It is true. In the county of Armenia in 1988, in the country of Armenia in 1988, Samuel and Daniel sent their young son Armand off to school. Samuel squatted before his son and looked him in the eye. Have a good day at school and remember, no matter what, I'll always be there for you. They hugged and the boy ran off to school. Hours later, a powerful earthquake rocked the area. In the midst of the pandemonium, Samuel and Daniel tried to discover what happened to their son, but they couldn't get any information. The radio announced that there were thousands of casualties. Samuel then grabbed his coat and he headed for the schoolyard. When he reached the area, he saw Armand's school was a pile of debris. Other parents were standing around crying. Samuel found the place where Armand's classroom used to be and began pulling a broken beam off the pile of rubble. He then grabbed a rock and put it to the side, and then he grabbed another one. And one of the parents looking on asked, what are you doing? He's digging for my son, he said. And the man said, you're just going to make things worse. The building is unstable. And he tried to pull Samuel away from his work, but Samuel just kept on working. And time went on. One by one, the other parents left. And then a firefighter tried to pull Samuel away from the rubble. And Samuel looked at him and he says, won't you help me? The firefighter just left and Samuel kept digging. All through the night and into the next day, Samuel continued digging, moving debris, rocks, and metal. Other parents placed flowers and pictures of their children on the ruins, but Samuel just kept working. Finally, as he picked up a beam and he pushed it out of the way, this is a day and a half, well, a night and a half, you know, started in the after school hours and then, uh, or around school hours, and then it went into the night and it went into the next day. As he picked up a beam and he pushed it out of the way, he heard a faint cry, help, help. Samuel listened, but he didn't hear anything again. And then he heard a muffled voice say, Papa. And Samuel began to dig furiously, as tired as he was. 
And finally, he could see his son. Come on out, son, he said. Come on out. No, Armand said. Let the other kids come first, because I know you'll get me. Child after child emerged until finally little Armand appeared. And Samuel took him in his arms, and they cried together. And little Armand said, I told the other kids not to worry, because you told me you'd always be there for me. Fourteen children were saved that day, all because one father was faithful. The difference real faith makes. There's a deep lesson here. Kids rely on what we tell them and promise them. They count on our words to be true. God has indeed given us a to-do list, and he says, remember. And to help us remember what he wants us to do. And he tells us to teach this to our children. Why? So they can start to rely on his words and his promises too. Adonai is shouting from heaven saying, Zakor, remember my word. Remember my son, Yeshua. And share your faith in me with your children. Shabbat Shalom. God bless you all.